minutes, let's go. I'll set my timer. Yep. All right, so I'm talking about a pretty broad topic here in terms of payment modernisation. There is a lot going on in this space and there's a lot that's been covered from previous speakers today. So I'll try and skip over everything that we've heard of once. Uh, if I feel that I have to add anything to it, I will. Um, first thing, this is my personal view. It is not the view of the Australian Federal Government. Yes, the government are looking at particular solutions, but it is not a replacement of technology. Uh, as a whole, there is a lot more risk and a lot more policy involved in just jumping over to something that is speculative like blockchain technology. I just want to cover off these main topics here. So the state of our system currently, uh, industry initiatives that have been going on for a few years and obviously the nuts and bolts then of where blockchain fits into this picture. Alright, so we saw in terms of digital payments how they've changed over the years. Uh, the first arguable transaction online was either a pizza or a pizza heart or a CD bought somewhere along the way. But then we moved into this, you know, PayPal coming out in 1998 and it did make a big change to industry. With that you started to see more user-friendly services like Google Checkout that were trying to, I guess, monetize that process in a way. But then we had the really big shift in terms of iPhone, Android coming out uh, in 2007, but even more so with M-Pesa. Now, if you're not aware of what M-Pesa is, it is a mobile payment solution in Kenya and Tanzania, and it is absolutely massive. It was built by Vodafone. Uh, once again to monetize an unbanked population who has obviously a large number of issues with government or otherwise. We then moved into apps, Starbucks, uh, regulatory hurdles uh, and also to provide some form of customer satisfaction. So there's four kind of main areas that I have looked at and researched into where they are finding that these sorts of things are, are forcing banks or financial institutions to change, so you have your mer merchants. So like Alex talked about earlier, these merchants are, are copying a fee for me to walk down and have a coffee every day, which I'm doing such a small micro transaction. It's for a small startup business or anything like that, it is an expensive cost out of the bottom line. You have that payment finality also where there's chargebacks, PayPal, 60 days, that I as a consumer could come along and go, well, you sent me the product from China, I actually got it, but you know, we have an issue here where I will say that I didn't get it and PayPal will take the money off the merchant and give it back to me. That's fraud, there's a huge risk in that and that's obviously something that is pushing for change in this industry. We have cost of business transactions, as I've just talked about, and that delayed settlement of sending money from one to another. When am I gonna get my money as a business? When can I actually say I own it? Then we have technology, which is a lot of the reason why we're here today, of course, is in terms of the fintech competition. Fintechs are quick, agile, and nimble. They can do things that big banks simply cannot do. Is that a fault of the big banks? Not really, but they have mainframe systems that existed for 20, 30 years. It's hard to change. So with that, one cool statistics that I heard the other week from the CEO of Fintech Australia. Australia has the second largest alternative finance market in the world behind China. We are a hot spot for the East to come over here, try things out, because we have good regulation and supportive government in this industry. Obviously, we have fraud and cyber threats, which are, uh, are causing a bit of conundrum for people and for companies in terms of data privacy, uh, and wearable and contactless payment channels, which are changing the face of how we all go about our daily business. Even that guy in Sydney, Meow Meow, whatever his name was, got the chip embedded, uh, his RFID tag embedded in his hand to make payments. Then you have consumers, which you and I are obviously wanting a better user experience. We want a journey. We want to be taken through go to woe in a very seamless manner. Now, is that because of millennials expecting a lot more than what we used to have? Yeah, maybe, but it is changing that market. Um, we're wanting improved payment timelines and transparency of that. We want to know where our money is up to. If I can buy something on PayPal from Amazon and I can see it tracked through the system and to me in a couple of days, why is it that I have to wait for my money to be floated on another market while it reaches another destination across the world for the banks to make money on me? So people are starting to be aware of these things uh, and obviously wanting to, to make a change in some way, shape or form. Uh, and obviously, they're wanting those secure and agile payments. They want to be able to bank when they want to bank. 
buy something when they want to buy something and see an outcome of that nearly instantaneously. And the biggest thing for, for banks or financial institutions as to what is really their concern is regulation. They have to meet these regulatory confines. They have fiduciary responsibilities that they need to uphold. And obviously, though their systems don't move quickly, if they're asked to jump, they need to say how high and make that happen when it comes to regulation. All right, I need to be wary of time. So we've had a look at that. And we've also got just KYC, AML, and your counterterrorism funding is obviously a big thing at the moment, which blockchain is helping with. So these are some of the industry initiatives that have been for these market forces that have kind of pushed for to make these changes occur. So the first thing we see is ISO 2022. Now, if you haven't uh, heard of this, it is the global standard for electronic messaging between financial institutions. It's trying to make it easier for these institutions to obviously send data back and forth. Then we have something which is massive in the PSD2. Now, this is something that's actually going to be happening, well, not going to, but definitely on the table with Treasury uh, at the moment in terms of Australia, where if I am a consumer of Bank A and I choose that I don't want to be Bank A anymore and go to Bank B, you have to move my data over my transaction history and everything about me over a common API or, or over a common framework that is going to be structured. And that's some policy that's going through currently uh, in Europe and like I said, is being looked at in Australia as well. And there was some pretty tight timelines. I think uh, last week when I was speaking to the CEO of FinTech Australia, they, they were looking at 12 months that they were gonna give banks in Australia to comply to that if that was to come to fruition. Uh, Kenya, like I said, in terms of M-Pesa, massive. 87% of their GDP went through M-Pesa in 2015 uh, because of their country and what is going on, obviously, in that space. But the downside to this is you have 33% of registered, I've got a um, state there, registered customers, that's what they pay in fees, and unregistered 66%. You're talking about some of the poorest people in the world and you're slapping them with that, it's not right. The next thing we have and we bring it home is in terms of Australia's new payment platform. Now this is arguably the most advanced real-time payment system in the world right now and that's come live this month or at least this year, and some of you might have started to, to see it around, I've got a thumbs up, that's great, um, which are using overlay services like PayID, it's like DNS for IP addresses. It just makes it easier. So instead of having to use a bank account and a bank number and all of that sort of stuff, what's your mobile number, mate? Let me send you something across, how good is that? 24 hours of sentiment, but once again, Australia only. We still have an issue with global remittance. Uh, so if we look over to the left here, in 2017, uh, there was 25 real-time payment systems worldwide that were live and 17 that were pending. Uh, and as of when I checked last week, 43 live uh, and 13 pending. So if we have a look at this, now this is an older photo from August last year. The uh, website, unfortunately, haven't updated. You can see Europe is getting smashed with these real-time payment systems. They love it, except they're probably not communicating with each other, even though they live so close to each other. And then... Asia and obviously some in America there. But once again, we still have this huge issue around sharing of data, a common platform, which we're starting to look at with blockchain technology and how we can apply that. So for me, I still think the, the elephant is still in the room for a lot of these changes. So we are seeing changes happen, yes, most certainly. Is it exactly what consumers want? Possibly not. No, it's not. But what we are seeing is banks and financial institutions, fintech, definitely wanting to try and make a change, mainly because it's gonna save them a bucket load of money in some industries, but we don't wanna see blockchain for blockchain's sake, because it's certainly happening out there. If you're not aware, there's over 2,000 cryptocurrencies out there. Bencoin, get it, it's worth nothing, but I could build that out in five minutes on the Ethereum platform. Don't do it, it's not worthwhile and you're gonna get stitched up by the ATO. Um, so we'll get into this uh, blockchain's potential role here because this is really the crux of, of what I wanted to cover off. So the first thing I wanted to say is that Australia actually leads the ISO Global Standards Committee. Uh, so Standards Australia, back in March last year, uh, they've got together, they've got the responsibility of organising all these countries to get together and say, well, how can we make this work? 
what's a common way that we all can work together to deliver some form of standard. Uh, and there's that stat again in terms of Australia. Now, why that makes blockchain's role in payment modernisation, it doesn't, but it's Australian, so I chucked it in there anyway. Um, something, though, to consider is in the US, 10% of all of Bank of America's costs come from moving currency checks around. Now, you consider how much money goes through Bank of America, it's a lot of money lost due to these sorts of things, whether it be remittance or otherwise. And it's estimated that it costs a central bank 50 to, what is it, 250 million per year, and that's from Accenture back in 2015, to deliver a real-time payment system. It's estimated at $5 billion for the US to do the same uh, for a large bank like Bank of America. But this is where it really hits home for me, and this is something that I am really passionate about in terms of blockchain technology, the unbanked. You have two billion plus at the last kind of numbers from World Bank that simply do not have access to the services, whether you're from the Middle East, whether you're from India, whether you're from any other African nation. So 350 million of them in Africa that simply do not have access to the services you and I take for granted. Now that, is that their problem? No, it's, it could be due to government, it could be due to war, it could be due to a range of things, but it's because banking services are actually really complex and expensive to run. But from a consumer perspective, we don't need to know that, just like we should never know that you have a product on a blockchain. It should be a seamless experience, irrespective of what you choose to do with it. And that's where peer-to-peer -peer lending has come in on blockchain. There's a company called ETHLEND, uh, there's a few of them out there now, but ETHLEND is something they've just gamified, KYC. Um, they're the first company to do it. Uh, practically, it's, it's a way to show that you have now got some form of credit history in a country like Africa. They're enabling somebody in such a country to go and get the first loan, whether that be for them to walk out and, and get you know, a business for the very first time, get an education or otherwise. It is certainly very exciting for these people in remote parts of our world. The de-risk. So you have whole countries that are simply not even considered for lending or otherwise because of similar factors. You can't get know your customer information. It's expensive to do so. So they say here that KYC costs yearly, now this is from Reuters, that 50 to $500 million yearly for banks to take that process. And it's 30 to 50 days that it can take for some of these customer information to come back. And if you're from a country, not here obviously in Australia, but if you're from a, a, a small African nation, that is big news if you can be included in some of these services. Because they skip landlines. You may wonder what are they gonna do with blockchain? Well, let me tell you, every single one of them has a mobile phone, if not two of them. They have the facilities, the internet connection, they just simply don't have a government that supports them. So that's something that you may not see here in Australia, but definitely in terms of blockchain technology, it has a potential role to absolutely revolutionise payments for those vulnerable customers. Because uh, it is said in um, the European Union in 2015, they took $700 billion off the table for emerging markets because they just simply couldn't bear the risk. Once again, is that a bank's problem? No, they have regulation that they need to abide by, but can we improve the process of how we actually get this customer information, this land title, all of that onto somewhere that's immutable? Yes, there's certainly things that we can do in that space. So this has been harped on quite a bit, obviously. It's secure, it's immutable, it's auditable. So Bitcoin, for example, is pseudonymous. You don't have a name or anything on there, but you have a Bitcoin at public key, which is, your, it's like your bank account number. That there is something that I could tell you and then you could follow that all the way through. There's companies even here in Brisbane that downloads a whole blockchain into a SQL database for you and you can go ahead and audit it. I know from a government perspective, if we were to use that, we would have to do the same thing. We would need to be able to have a traceable method for us to understand where your payments are coming from or otherwise, otherwise how am I going to believe that's true to pay you, I don't know, a Centrelink payment. Uh, it's compliant and obviously cryptographically secure or can be made compliant in some way, shape or form. Obviously it enables real-time payments. That's one of the big benefits of this, is that you can go from any place in the world and send something in seconds and it can be in your hand. Now, whether that be you know, in, in the form of a Bitcoin or in form of a consortium, 
that is yet to be seen in terms of their particular transactions, but it is certainly possible. Programmability, so we've talked about smart contracts. Oracles, obviously, that being able to have that real-world data that can be fed into a smart contract, because a smart contract actually sits effectively on the blockchain, whereas an oracle sits halfway off to be able to fed sensor data. If you crash a car, the sensor says so, off we go. Cost reduction. So there's no need to reconcile multiple shared ledgers across bank accounts or anything like that. You have a shared source of truth in many ways. So that's estimated, uh, like Will has just said, anywhere between 50 to $20 billion by 2022 uh, for infrastructure, compliance and trading, what banks could save just by implementing some form of blockchain technology for these particular types of processes. Because global remittance yearly is anywhere up to $40 billion in fees. Uh, value creation, so it's estimated to, to add value to businesses in some way, shape or form. I won't go into that too much. And like I said, no boundaries. It enables this cross-border transaction, whether you're using a cryptocurrency to do it or using a sovereign-issued fiat currency. Uh, there are services such as Ripple that enable that. So where can we apply this to blockchain, uh, sorry, to financial markets? Well, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it is something uh, where some of them do apply. So digital currencies, like we've seen, foreign exchange, which I'll go into a real live example of that after. Uh, international remittance, micropayments, so going down to the coffee. So if you're not aware, you can go down to Emporium Hotel in the Valley, a company in Brisbane called Travel by Bit, buy your beers, pay for your hotel, all in cryptocurrencies. And we're also going to have the first cryptocurrency airport in the world here in Brisbane. Uh, collateral registry, so I think it was 2016, CBA and Treasury actually started working on putting land registries on uh, some form of blockchain. I haven't seen much of it since then, so if that's still going, that's great. Uh, internal systems, so replacing any form of shared ledger between governments. Uh, we share data, obviously, with a huge number of agencies. How could we utilise some form of shared ledger system as a single source of truth? Well, that is certainly something that we have uh, a keen interest in. Uh, in financial services, so you have your capital market, securities, bonds or otherwise, crowdfunding, insurance, lending, syndicated loans. I'm not going to harp on about it. It's certainly something that can be used. But this is what I like to call the trilemma in terms of you can't have all good. This is not a silver bullet and that is certainly something that I hope you all understand is that there's application specific thing that you need to apply this to. Uh, and it comes down to looking at the speed, security and decentralisation. You can only have two at the present moment. So down the bottom we have uh, Bitcoin, obviously a public ledger, uh, and then we look at private. So you've got Ripple, uh, CSRG, which is Red Belly Blockchain, which is what uh, Adrian was talking about earlier, R3 Quarter and Hyperledger. Uh, Hyperledger was a project by IBM. I think it's actually been donated by them to Linux Foundation. Um, and R3 is actually not really a blockchain. It's more of a distributed ledger where it even allows you and I to make transactions, but it doesn't have to be written back to a block. So it's a bit of a funny one. But like I said, you can only have two. So if you look at Bitcoin, it's got security and decentralization, but does it have speed? No way, shape or form. Seven to 10 transactions a second, that is it. There's efforts to obviously improve that with Bitcoin's Lightning Network that went live beta version today, um, which is awesome. So that allows a second layer solution off chain scaling. They're talking about in terms of transaction throughput, it allows you and I to do as many transactions as possible between each other and then only write the final amount or the outcome of that transaction to the main chain, obviously taking a lot of that transaction off um, the, the main chain, which we don't want to bog down with useless information. All right, so what are some of the challenges ahead in terms of financial markets, in terms of adoption of such technology? Well, maturity. You're lacking talent. If you go out there and try and find an Ethereum dev that knows Solidity, or anything like that, good luck. You're going to be paying some big bucks for them because they're starting to ask big figures. Because these ICOs are raising millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars in minutes. And then they just go, I want this. So there is a lot of competition in that space. Uh, like Adrian said earlier, if you have any JavaScript uh, team members, keep them by, start feeding them some information to, to train them up. Scalability, so sharding. Now, we didn't talk about this at all today, but sharding is practically 
uh, blockchains within blockchains in a way. It breaks off the main chain into multiple subchains which have their own consensus algorithms, can run their own governance, but it allows for parallel parallelization of transactions uh, which then is fed up once again to the main chain and then you have Plasma, which is smart contracts within smart contracts on the Ethereum network. Once again, enabling what they're saying, millions and millions of transactions a second. It also has the ability for if something has gone wrong, which we talked about earlier with smart contracts, you can actually wipe it back to that point and start again if somebody has done that. So that is something that's very cool, but it is theory. It's in paper, it hasn't been delivered yet. Uh, so hang out for that for Ethereum's network. Uh, DAG, so you had a question earlier about other types of blockchains. When we talk about that, we should look at distributed ledgers as a whole. Then you have blockchain, then you have DAG, which is directed at cyclic graphs. Uh, you have hash graph and a range of other block lattices which are coming out because it is still a very new space and there's a lot of scientific research that's going into how can we build out these networks for scalability but maintain security because that is one of its biggest uh, advantages. Uh, Off-chain networks, like I said, and consensus algorithm, algorithm. So, like we said, proof of work, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake. There's proof of authority. There's, there's heaps of them out there. Uh, as to their, you know, validity, we'll we'll soon see. Uh, integration. So, as we can all be appreciate, if you have old systems that have been there for a long time, you have service level agreements with SAP, Salesforce, or otherwise, you have contracts in place and embedded processes that you're not just going to drop at the hat to, to change. I certainly know that we will not be doing that. Um, atomic swaps, which is another question, how do you co communicate across chain? Uh, atomic swaps is one way to do that. It practically creates a safe box where you put up some form of private information. It's known as a zero knowledge proof. You don't have to prove who you are. They don't have to prove who they are. But if you try and take that information, you expose your information to them and then they can take away what you have put up. So if that's a transference of one Bitcoin to them and a swap for a Litecoin, well, so be it. Cyber security, so if you're not sure what the Byzantine General's problem is, please have a look at that. Uh, it is a, it's an awesome thing that Bitcoin has solved. Uh, DDoS attacks, so what we're finding is that these networks can be spammed with empty, useless transactions. So Bitcoin can only handle seven transactions a second and the cost of those transactions are quite low or if you have a lot of money, like a I don't know, a Russian state or something like that, and you want to inflict some pain on these networks, these sorts of things are possible, so obviously you need to keep that in mind if you choose to go with a public network, not a private network. Uh, quantum computing, arguable, because if that was to occur, they're going to attack your banks first, they're not going to come and attack Bitcoin's network. You're going to get more money out of a bank, what they're transferring every day than this, so it's certainly not uh, of a concern for people like Andreas Antonopoulos, who is the world's leading Bitcoin expert. Um, legal and regs. So this is a big thing for European Union citizens. They have the ability at any one time to go, I want to be forgotten. So how do you do that on an immutable blockchain? I'd love to see the solution to it, uh, because that is definitely going to be a problem for such states and sharing of that data. Uh, costs. So there's no commercial off the shelf that you can just go out and buy. You've got R3 quarter and Hyperledger, but they still need to be configured as such to your network. But it's not like an SAP out of the box solution where you can just tweak a few things for your transactions and what you do. You're going to need to build the thing wholly and solely yourself. So good luck to you if that is going to be the case. Data and privacy, we've covered that off. Uh, this last thing is big, value privacy. Make sure it aligns actually with what your business is trying to achieve. Have the customer in mind. Don't do this just for the hell of it. It's not going to be worth it. You're going to spend money and time accumulating resources and knowledge in the area to only find out that it's going to be an absolute waste. So please do that due diligence, research it. Um, don't just jump on the hype train because you'll, you'll burn yourself every single time with these markets. This here actually shows that the market forces in terms of the value that people have seen in terms of banking, etc., on what the adoption rate has been like. So that only runs up to Jan 2017 from CB Insights. Jan 16, if you look at the amount of banks and partners or otherwise there, there is a huge amount of people, banks or otherwise, doing work in this space. All right, so let's have a look at some current and future uh, projects that are going on. So. ASX, so if you're not aware, the ASX has been testing for over the last two years to replace chess. 
they are doing it. It's happening this month, according to the last information, uh, with a blockchain solution. It's a privatised thing, but it will certainly uh, pave the way for, obviously, bigger projects in the future between private enterprises. Oztrack, once again, announced this month that they're going to put AML reports of your 10K transactions or otherwise on the blockchain also. Uh, Commonwealth Bank and Ripple. So back in 2015, Commonwealth Bank allowed its subsidiaries to transfer between each other using the Ripple protocol, not Ripple as in XRP. The paradigm is, needs to change and now we're getting into that kind of acceptance phase where there's a bit more promise than there are threats. Uh, they're trying it out for themselves. There is definitely a use case. Is Bitcoin the answer? No. There's going to be a lot more that come along after it. Is it a private or a public blockchain? That's for up to you to decide. There's use cases for both. So slamming one and not the other, it's unfair because there is certainly the opportunity in both of them because you can have a private chain within a public chain on Ethereum. So please do that research. Uh, so the question is, are you ready? I wasn't going to finish with this corny quote from Bill Gates saying that, you know, uh, we overestimate two years but underestimate ten years and the fact that Bitcoin has been around now for nine, you've got one year left, but I'm not going to save you that. So is there any questions? Because I'm on the 30 minute mark, beautiful. Do you know how ASX has implemented blockchain? They haven't actually shared from what I found, no. So it is something that, yeah, 100%, 100%. Because it has to handle hundreds of thousands of transactions a second, and that has only been achieved on a private blockchain, and that's because you have the ability to control the consensus as such. You can assign who you want to be the controlling authority, just like Ripple does uh, and a few other networks. Not what I've seen in recent, um, but it doesn't say that it's not happening. Yeah. It doesn't say that it can't be shared from particular security clearances. <laughs> just interested from a plain title perspective. Um, yeah, a few years ago they put forward this agenda and things went down a certain path, perhaps maybe not the correct path. And yeah. You know, some other interested parties coming in to perhaps correct that. So yeah, well, th there's definitely land title projects overseas that are happening. Uh, especially once again in Africa where you know these guys could have inherited land from their families many many years ago they don't actually have that piece of paper and even if they did the government's so corrupt that they walk up they stamp their foot and they lose their land so this is a, a way that they're trying to kind of get back a bit of their independence as well any other questions wonderful thank you, thank you. Wonderful speeches, spellbound for everyone.